Good evening to you. If you got your New Testaments with you this evening, be opening up to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Primero de Corintios, capítulo 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. That is where we're going to find a beginning place for our study tonight. It's where we're going to spend most of our time tonight. So if you've got your New Testament, be opening up there to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And we'll be starting there shortly. Thank you for being here tonight. We again have visitors. We're thankful you're here. If you're able to stick around just a little while after services so that we can get to know you a little bit better, we sure would appreciate that. Thank you for being here. Carmelo and Susanna are here and their family. Glad to see them. Carmelo will be praying for you as you travel to Guatemala. Hope you will be returning to us safely after that. Uh, In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you find the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul uh, writing to a church that was going through great difficulty and going through great difficulty on a multitude of different fronts. If you were trying to design the ideal church that you wanted to be a part of, most likely it wouldn't look anything like the church at Corinth. They had struggle after challenge. They were infighting. They were divided. It is what we would most likely call a mess. But the Lord hadn't given up hope on them. Paul had not given up hope on them. And what we see in, uh, at least partially in 1 Corinthians 5, is some teaching that is done on some specific scenarios that had presented themselves at Corinth with the hopes that those situations would be addressed in a godly manner and be remedied. And I think 2 Corinthians would demonstrate to us in the first three chapters that at least in this area, the church in Corinth heeded what the Spirit wrote and made the necessary changes. There are a whole host of issues at the church in Corinth, but 1 Corinthians chapter brings one to the forefront, actually two. There is the singular sin among among the, the brethren there of a man who had his father's wife who was engaged in open sexual immorality. But then secondly, we have the response or rather lack of a response from the church at Corinth and how that was troubling equally. Start with me with what Mitch read for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 1, verso 1, where the Spirit through Paul writes, it is actually reported that there is immorality among you, and immorality of such a kind as does not even exist among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. And you have become arrogant and have not mourned instead, in order that the one who has done this deed might be removed from your midst. For I, on my part, though absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your boasting is not good, verse 6. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. We want to spend a little time this evening talking about the biblical concepts of discipline and fellowship here in the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It was in a recent Bible class that some of our rather astute middle school and junior high students, asked some questions about this passage, some really good questions. I uh, did job of answering it, and I said, I want to take a stab at answering some of those questions too. And so here's my effort to take a stab at some of those questions as well. Let's talk first about the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. What's going on here? Well, come back to chapter 1, Primero de Corintios capítulo 1. And what we're going to see is that we've got a divided church here in Corinth. This is, in fact, one of the first issues that the Holy Spirit identifies with the church at Corinth. As you're looking down here, verse 10, verso 10. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. 
For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. So picture this, this local church, but divided all sorts of different ways with little cliques and parties inside of it. Some saying, I belong to Apollos, I am a disciple of Cephas, I belong to Paul, I am of Christ. Now Paul's going to make a, a point later in in chapters 2 and 3 and 4 that, that's beyond our point this evening. Uh, Paul says he is, he is transferring these things figuratively to himself and to Apollos uh, that folks may learn not to boast. And, and what I take that to mean is there really wasn't a Paul or an Apollos party in the church at Corinth. But that Paul was, was using his own name so as to not give credence to some of the divisions that were going on there. There were divisions, and there were divisions along the lines of personalities, but Paul was not going to deal with it in that way so as to have his words twisted as though he was supporting these different minor divisions that were occurring within the congregation. The problem is that there were divisions, and those divisions needed to be healed. Come over to chapter 2. You had a church which needed to rededicate themselves to the wisdom and the revelation of God. They needed to listen to what God had to say, and specifically, they needed to listen to the apostles. They needed to listen to Paul. Uh, we do not speak wisdom. This is chapter 2 and verse 6, capitulo 2, verso 6. We do not speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, this wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, things which the eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered into the heart of man, the all that God has prepared for those that love him. And sometimes we will have these passages uh, kind of referenced maybe at a funeral or something like that, and we talk about the glories and the splendors of heaven. And heaven is going to be splendid, and heaven is going to be uh, full of glory. But brethren, that's not at all what chapter 2 and verse 9 is talking about. Chapter 2 and verse 9 is not talking about heaven. Chapter 2 and verse 9 is talking about God's revelation to mankind. What God has revealed. Verse 10, For to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Or who among men knows the thoughts of the man except the Spirit of a man who is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. I don't know what you're specifically thinking unless you do what? Unless you tell me, right, this is at the root of so many of our disagreements as husbands and wife, isn't it? I don't know what you're thinking unless you tell me. I can try to read your body language, but I fail at that sometimes. I know, though, what you're thinking when you do what? When you tell me. How do we know God's thoughts? When he communicates them, and how does he communicate them here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2? Through the Spirit. Now, verse 12, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak. Here is Paul talking of himself, talking of the work of himself and his other apostles, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. They needed to listen to Paul, who was known, verse 16, who was known the mind of Christ, that he should instruct him. But we, Paul says, as the apostles, we have the mind of Christ. And you need to hear us. You had a church that needed to listen. Listen to what the apostles had to say. Listen to what Paul had to say. In our focus tonight, this was a church which needed to respond to a sinful brother. And here's where we want to spend most of our time. Chapter 5 and verse 1. Capitulo uh, cinco verso uno. You had a brother who was living in sexual immorality. This is the issue. Well, whether or not the specific issue is, is incest or something like that, I, I don't think that's really the point here. The point is you have a brother who is living in open sexual immorality, right? There is a sin among you that is not even named amongst the Gentile or amongst the heathen that a man has his father's wife. The sin was clear. 
And there's, there's no doubt, not even in the community, in, in the wicked community of Corinth, whose, whose sexual norms and mores uh, would leave many of us slack-jawed and aghast even here in the 21st century. The sin even in that society was clear. This was beyond the pale. This, this was sinful. And everybody, even those outside the church, recognized that it was wrong. The greater problem comes in in verse 2 when the, the sin had not been addressed. This brother's sin was not private. It was not hidden. It was open. Everyone knew about it. And the church had tolerated it. The church had seen this brother and seen this brother living in this open and unrepentant sin. And what had the church done about it? Here's what they'd done. Verse 2. You have become arrogant and you have not mourned in order that the one who has done this deed might be removed from your midst. They hadn't tried to address the issue. The brother was still there. But more than that, here was the church, the church at Corinth boasting about how spiritual and how godly they were. This is certainly what Jesus was talking about when we're trying to pull the splinter out of someone's eye when we have a board sticking out of our own. This is what was going on at the church in Corinth. So what, what, what were they to do? And, and then by extension, what are we to do? How, how do we respond in a local church when we've got a brother or a sister who is living in open and unrepentant sin? How do we handle these issues? Well, number one, I hope, I think you would agree with me, number one, we need to make sure that sin has actually occurred, Right? We need to make sure that, that what we're seeing and what we're dealing with or what we're ramping up to deal with is actually sin, right? Th there was no doubt of it here. It was very clear this man was living in open sexual immorality with his father's wife. Paul says in verse 3, On my part, though absent in body, but present in spirit, I have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. Paul says, uh, through, through what the Spirit has revealed to me, I know what's going on here. This is what is going on, and this needs to be addressed. And what I'm telling you then, tie this in with verse 4, what I'm telling you then is just exactly what the Lord would want you to do. Remember, because back to chapter 2, we have the what? We have the mind of Christ. Here's what Jesus wanted them to do. First things first, make sure sin has actually occurred, Right? This is not gossip, this is not happenstance, this is not hearsay, this is okay. Sin has actually occurred. If sin has not actually occurred, 1 Corinthians 5 in this process that we're talking about is not the process for us to follow. But if sin has actually occurred, then what do we do? Well, verse 4, we need to be steadied in our minds and realize that this process of discipline that is laid out for us is done with the approval and the authority of Jesus. This is an important point to see. Verse 4. Paul through the Spirit writes, In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus. Number one, this is done in the name of Jesus, that is, it has his what? It has his sanction, it has his approval. All right, uh, I, I would submit to you, I, I think there's so much misunderstanding about what congregational church discipline looks like and so much misunderstanding in the religious world at large as to what it actually is that we might look at it and say, well, that doesn't sound very much like Jesus. And I think if we're using the world as a standard, I think I could probably get behind that, you know. When we look at the world around us and we hear this idea of church discipline or withdrawal equated with the idea of excommunication, you've heard that phrase before, where basically we just cut somebody off and have nothing to do with them and nothing to say to them. If that's what I'm thinking when I'm reading 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I could understand why someone would say, you know, that doesn't sound very much like Jesus. And you're right. It doesn't sound very much like Jesus. Because that's not what Jesus 
instructs here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians 5 is not about excommunication. It's not about barring the doors of the assembly and standing guard and making sure this person doesn't set foot in the building. 1 Corinthians 5 is not about never speaking to someone ever again. And we need to get that settled in our mind and make sure that what we're reading and practicing is consistent with the person and the teachings of Jesus. Look at verse 5. Here is this open sin, this unrepentant sin, this public sin. What needs to happen? Verse 5, verso 5. Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, what in the world does that mean? Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus. Well, I want you to look down here at verse 11. In the very end of verse 11, when Paul says, I didn't, when I wrote to you not to associate with the immoral, I did not mean with the immoral people of this world, but verse 11, I did mean don't associate with any so-called brother who is, and fill in the blank, and then the very last phrase in verse 11, not even to eat with such a one. Now here's what that tells me. What verse 11 tells me is that this little phrase here in verse 5, destruction of the flesh, is not the idea of putting somebody to death, right? That may be a trite point and some may be thinking, okay, Tyler, yeah, we get that. But let's make sure we get our bases covered. Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh is not saying deliver such a one over to Satan and kill him. Verse 11 would indicate ongoing life, not even to eat with such a one. So this person is still alive. First, verse 5 is not saying kill the person. This is not some sort of restorative honor killing. This is not blood atonement or anything like that. Uh, Strong says about this word deliver such a one up to Satan it's the idea of surrendering that is yielding up it, it's not a physical punishment it's not like putting somebody in the stocks like you used to see in more puritanical societies putting someone in the stocks and punishing them that way and kind of putting them on display for the whole community to see that's not the idea here the idea rather here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 in, in delivering such a one over to Satan is the idea of destroying a fleshly attitude. Delivering one over to Satan means, okay, if, if this is the course that you have chosen to pursue in your life and you're not turning away from it, just know I'm not walking with you down that road. And if you're going down that road, you're going down that road alone. I'm trying to get you to see that what you're doing is contrary to the will of God. And that if you're going in this way, you have no place with the people of God who are trying to serve God. And so you're delivering one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, not the body. But going back to chapter 3, and this is how this, this idea is used here, for the destruction of the fleshly attitude, right? Verse 1 of chapter 3, capitulo tres verso uno, and I, brethren could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to babes in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it, and indeed now you still are not able, because you are still, verse 3, you are still what? You're still fleshly. Well, these people have been in the flesh all along. This point doesn't have anything to do with being in skin, in the flesh, tangibly. Since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? He's talking about a fleshly attitude. Delivering such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh is about destroying a fleshly attitude so that that doesn't inhibit somebody from coming back and serving, serving the Lord, being what they should be. Right? No man can serve what? No man can serve two masters. He will, either he will either love the one and hate the other or cling to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And that is the, the general truth that's being revealed here in this passage. And so you get to the rest of chapter 5 and verse 5. 
you deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That is, this action, this congregational action is taken for the benefit of the erring brother. That's sometimes what we miss, and it's something we cannot miss. We desperately cannot miss this. That church discipline has in back of it a desire to save the one who has walked away. We're doing all of this so that his spirit may be saved. Why? Because he's gone into sin. And he's gone into unrepentant sin. And he's not being reached and he's not changing and he's decided to walk down this path. What can we do? Well, here's what the end of that process looks like. We deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh with the hopes that his spirit may be saved from it, with with the hopes that, that this awakens him. This is a reflection, as meager as it might be, this is a reflection of your relationship with God that if you choose to walk down this path, you've separated yourself from God, and if you've separated yourself from God, You've separated yourself from God's people. So keep working through this then with me. Let's let's do a little bit more with this phrase, deliver such a one uh, to Satan. This is not describing pentagrams and some sort of otherworldly ritual. This is describing action that is taken towards a sinful brother, which is enacted with the hopes of getting him to realize his current state of life. The way that you're living is outside of how God would have you to live. And we're doing this not because we hate you, not because we dislike you. We're doing this because we love you and we want you back where you should be and we want you back where you need to be. Uh, Do you see a relationship between this and what we see back in Matthew chapter 18? Certainly there's, there's a relationship here. Come back with me to Matthew chapter 18. Mateo uh, capitulo 18, verso 15. Matthew chapter 18 and in verse 15. Matthew chapter 18 and in verse 15. If your brother sins, and some translations add, uh, if your brother sins against you, go and reprove him in private. If he listens, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax gatherer. Do you see some sort of relationship, some similarity, between what's going on in Matthew 18 and what's going on in 1 Corinthians 5? There is some overlap here. Now, there are some distinctions here. There is a difference Uh, Matthew chapter 18, this certainly seems to be a a more private sin than what we have in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Indeed, some translations opt to add in this phrase, if your brother sins against you, trying to emphasize the idea that the process laid out here in Matthew chapter 15, uh, or Matthew 18 rather, is one that is dealing with sins that are much more private. But a private sin certainly is not in view in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, would you agree with me? 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is about open, flagrant, unrepentant sin. A man has his father's wife, and not only do the folks in the church know it, the folks in the community know it as well. And so there are similarities to Matthew 18, but the two are not exactly the same. And so what does this action look like? Come back to 1 Corinthians 5. What does this action of delivering such a one to Satan, what does it look like? Well, I think we can, we can describe a little bit of it here. Uh, it, it looks like cleaning out old leaven, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse 7, clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump just as you are in fact unleavened for Christ our Passover has also been sacrificed for us. Now, I don't know, admittedly, a whole lot about cleaning out unleavened. I haven't cleaned out a whole lot of Uh, leaven and unleavened bread in my life. I enjoy eating bread, but I haven't done a lot of cleaning up. But but here's something I have done. You ever go to a restaurant and you order your entree, you're so excited to get it. Maybe it's a soup, right? I'm not a big fan of flavored water as a main course, 
So we're thinking, that's what soup is, flavored water. So we're thinking maybe, maybe a heartier soup, may, maybe a bisque or something like that, a chowder, right? And it's served to you, and you're all excited for this delicious chowder, whatever it might be. But then in, in, in the chef's mind, in the restaurant's mind, it's got to be gussied up a little bit, right? And so sometimes they may put a little bit of, what, a little bit of parsley on there, give it a, a pop of color, right? Okay, not a big fan of parsley but it's okay. Or maybe cilantro. Okay, that, that, might be, that might be too. Or scallions. Oh. Or, or green onions. Even worse. You take a perfectly good entree and you ruin it by putting diced up scallions and onions on it. And I am not ashamed to admit that at 39 years old, if I go to Olive Garden, the, the pinnacle of fine dining in America today, and they do that, I'm going to sit there with my little fork and I'm going to pluck out all of that scallion and all of that onion. I don't want it and it ruins the dish for me. Cleaning out the old leaven. We're separating things that don't belong. And that's the point. What does this action look like? It looks like separation. It looks like decreased levels of association. Uh, look at verse 11. I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he should be an immoral person, covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler. No, don't associate with one. Don't even eat with such a one. Or verse 13, remove the wicked man from your midst. Now let's talk about this for just a moment. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. There's another side of the coin that we need to notice for just a moment. Segundo de Thessalonicenses capítulo 3, verso 14. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and look over with me at verse 14. There is the reality that we're not talking about excommunication. We need to leave lines of communication open even towards those who are being disciplined, if we can use that phrase tonight. Some level of association is going to be necessary if we are to speak to this erring brother or sister and try to win them back. Uh, th- that, that's why th- this idea of completely and absolutely shutting the door and cutting someone off and no more communication ever just does not fit the biblical paradigm. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, look at verse 14. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that man and do not associate with him. Same language, 1 Corinthians 5. Do not associate with him that he may be put to shame. Destruction of the flesh. Verse 15. But do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Look, things have to be different in this process we're talking about, 1 Corinthians 5. Things cannot go on as though everything is okay because everything is not okay. But let's make sure we also understand that 1 Corinthians 5 and 2 Thessalonians 3 and passages like that do not mean we shut the door and we're done with somebody. We've got to be able to talk. We've got to be able to try to influence them to win them back. The Lord is not forbidding all communication with the erring brother and therefore we must understand not to associate with somebody back to 1 Corinthians 5 we've got to understand that phrase not to associate with in a way that does not result in excommunication so then what does that look like and that's kind of the $64,000 question and I don't know that the Lord shows us an exact picture of what it looks like Because perhaps no picture is going to look absolutely the same. But we do get some insight. Come back to chapter 5 in 1 Corinthians and look with me at verse 11. Primero de Corintios, capítulo 5, verso 11. Verse 11. 
And I promise you, I'm not getting an alert on my phone or anything. I'm just telling my timer to be quiet for a moment. What does it mean when he says, do not associate with any so-called brother in verse 11? Well, look at the end of verse 11. He says, no, not even to eat with such a one. You ever notice there's something uniquely special about dining together? Right? What seems to be under consideration in this text, what seems to be under consideration are just the normal expressions of togetherness that we share with each other. Right? There's one brother who has recently asserted that this eating in 1 Corinthians 5 uh, refers to some sort of congregational meal. Maybe the Lord's Supper, maybe the love feast in Jude or something like that. Uh, that sort of interpretation fails, number one, because we simply don't know what a love feast was in the book of Jude. But secondly, we can rest assured that what Paul is not giving the Spirit's approval to is a recreational meal that, that's organized and served by the local church because that's going to be uncontrovertibly rebuked in 1 Corinthians 11 when Paul says, you have houses to eat and drink in. So we're back to what does it mean not to associate with a brother or a sister. And here's what I can tell you. When we have a brother or a sister who's going down this path, and we have to withdraw from them, and there has to be this disassociation to some degree. We do an unrepentant brother or sister wrong when we treat him or her as though nothing has changed. If we treat that brother or sister as though everything is okay and nothing has changed and I'm okay and you're okay and everything's okay, we do them a disservice. That's what's being said here in 1 Corinthians 5. We can admonish such a brother. We shouldn't return evil for evil. We shouldn't hate him, dislike him, or loathe him. What we do toward him must be done out of love, and that includes the process of discipline. Somebody says, well, well what does that mean? And I freely admit it can mean a lot of things. Look, I know people that like to go out and fish. And it may look like, hey, I can't go out fishing with this person. But I'm not going to say that it means you can't ever go fishing with that person because I'll tell you this, and I've told you this story before. We have an elder, had an elder back at Judson Road in Longview who when we had a brother or sister who might be getting out of line or might be going down this path or he's trying to win a brother or sister back, he would call them up and say, hey, you want to go fishing with me? He was known as, a, as an excellent fisher, knew Lake of the Forks, like the back of his hand, could, could bring in fish when nobody else was getting any. And you weren't fishing from the bank, you're out on the boat. But what happens when you're on the boat? You're on the boat with him, isolated, you and him. And guess what he's going to talk about? He's going to talk about, don't you need to come back and get your life right? Now, if I'm going to say no fishing, that's kind of an arbitrary line to draw. And it excludes what happens out on Lake Fork, which is just exactly what the Lord's calling us to do in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. I, I don't think we can get up here and say specific scenarios that you can or can't engage in. But here's what we can say. If, if my association with them is leaving them the impression that I'm okay and you're okay and everything between us is okay, that's when we're in error. That's the impression we cannot leave. And if we're leaving that impression... We're sending them, we're, we're doing them an injustice. Because, and this is important, when these moments happen in the, in the life of a congregation, sometimes you hear phrases like, well, uh, the, the elders have withdrawn from this brother. The, the, the elders have, have dealt with this brother. But I want you to look here at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Who's taking this action? I'm looking at chapter 5 and verse 1, and I see the phrase, among you. Or I'm looking at chapter 5 and verse 2, and I'm seeing the phrase, your midst. I'm looking at chapter 5 and verse 4, and I'm seeing the phrase, when you are assembled. Or chapter 5 and verse 12, within the church. Or chapter 5 and verse 13, among yourselves. Who's taking this action? It's not the elders. They may be leading in it. 
But this is congregational action. And as a church, we have to be in this together. We've got to work together to try to bring back our ones who are erring. Somebody says, well, well this, that just seems harsh. Why withdraw? I can tell you four reasons why from 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at verse 5. We withdraw for, for, for the eternal well-being of that brother. And I would reckon that if, that if you and I talk about this outside of the assembly, we could all come up with people that we know. I'm thinking of, of one brother right now from Southside who was my counselor at camp a couple years. Who was withdrawn from. And because he was withdrawn from, found his way back. That church discipline accomplished just exactly what it was designed to do. Chapter 5 and verse 5. Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Withdrawal. We go through this process of discipline for the eternal well-being of the erring brother. We go through this process of discipline for the purity of the local church, right? So that this unleavened lump of dough might remain unleavened and not be tarnished by the leaven that is brought in. And by the way, that's a pretty unique way to describe sin, describing it as leaven. What does leaven do? It grows and it pervades. Chapter 5 and verse 1, would you agree with me that we withdraw as a witness to the surrounding community? That there was something going on here in the church at Corinth that even the community recognized was wrong. How could you shine your light in the community if even the community could look in and say, what's going on there is not right? That's not to say that we take our cues from the community around us, but it is to say we need to let our lights shine in the community, and the community needs to be able to look at us and see what godliness actually is. And like we said, when Paul says that we're doing this by the authority of Jesus in the name of Jesus, we need to do this because we want to be consistent with who Jesus is and what he says, with his gospel. Now, let's wrap up with these, these three questions. Number one, well, why does 1 Corinthians 5 look different than Matthew chapter 18? And that's a pretty good question and a pretty astute question. Uh, because what you're seeing in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 was a public, open, persistent, and well-known sin. And it certainly doesn't seem that that's the case in Matthew chapter 18. You're dealing with two different set of circumstances. And with these different sets of circumstances, you have two different responses to them. And indeed, if, if the, the idea in Matthew 18 is the idea of private sin, your brother sins against you if that is the idea in Matthew chapter 18 we see then a very distinct difference between Matthew 18 and 1 Corinthians chapter 5. How about this does, does the principle of withdrawal does it apply only in cases of sexual immorality that is well if we're going to go by the book the book says sexual immorality but it doesn't say anything about other sins okay well number one if God was to identify every sin for which one would be liable to discipline, how big would that list have to be? But number two, you notice in chapter 5 and verse 6 that the term is just generic, leaven, kind of leaves that up to interpretation, or rather than leaves it up to interpretation, opens the door for more than just sexual immorality. And then you've got this idea expanded in, in verse 11, right? This is useful here. Not only an immoral person, but also a covetous person or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler. And then does your Bible have a note in chapter 5 and verse 13 that the last sentence in verse 13 is actually a quotation of the Old Testament? Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. And it's interesting, that's a quotation of Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 7. And idolatry is not the point in Deuteronomy 24 and verse 7. Neither is sexual immorality. It's actually the idea of human trafficking and violence. So add that to the list, right? 
The, the point being, 1 Corinthians 5 is, is not describing one unique sin for which one is liable to this process, but all other sins lie outside of this process. That's not the point. The point is, this is how we deal with cases of open and unrepentant sin in a local church. And finally, hey, if I'm going through this, if sadly this is something that we have to undertake at some point in, in, in the life of this local church, how do I make sure I don't associate with, chapter 5 and verse 11, a brother or sister from, from whom we've withdrawn fellowship? And, and I suppose the answer is simply this. I just make sure that, that my actions towards them don't give them the impression that they're in a right relationship with God. Can I talk with them? Second Thessalonians would indicate that I should. But what kinds of things are we going to talk about? Tell you, I'm going to be sure that at some point our conversation talks about, hey, you know where you need to be. And you know what you need to do. You need to come back to the Lord and I want to help you. What can I do? But if our communication, if our interactions don't try to draw them back to the Lord but just kind of affirm them where they are or, or, or just leave the entire situation untouched, are, are we really following with the ethic we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 5? And the answer is it's not. This is never a pleasant issue to discuss, and so we discuss it when, as far as I know, it's not on the table. Right? Everybody always asks, we get the 1 Corinthians 5 church discipline sermon, who's up, for the, who's up for the discipline? The answer is, I don't know of anything like that right now. And so th this isn't preached as a y'all get ready for what's about to come. Like I said, there were some really good questions that were asked about this. We have, if you haven't noticed, we, we have just, just an exceptional group of young people here. And you guys need to know that. And you guys need to know that we're proud of you. And you, you guys mean a lot to us. And your interest in spiritual things and your efforts in serving the Lord are encouraging. And we want to do everything that we can to help you keep growing. And when you have questions about biblical things, you ask them. And we'll sit and talk about them. We'll find Bible answers for them. And we're going to serve the Lord together. It is never pleasant to talk about 1 Corinthians 5 because talking about 1 Corinthians 5 always deals with sin. And we see in 1 Corinthians 5 how ruinous sin can be. But we see that there are answers to sin. And as we come into 2 Corinthians, we see the reality that what happened in 1 Corinthians 5 seems to have worked. Come over with me very quickly, and this is where we're ending, in 2 Corinthians. Come over here to 2 Corinthians and I want you to look at chapter 2 and verse 4. Segundo de Corintios, capítulo 2, verso 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 4. So here we are, months down the road. Paul writes for the third time to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians. If that blows your mind, we'll talk about it sometime later. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 4. Paul through the Spirit writes this, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be made sorrowful, but that you might know the love which I have, especially for you. But if anyone has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow, not to me, but in some degree, in order to say not too much to all of you. Now verse 6. Sufficient for such a one is this punishment which was inflicted by the majority. This brother had been dealt with. And had been dealt with sufficiently. Verse 7 so that on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him, lest somehow such a one be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Wherefore, I urge you, reaffirm your love for him. What happened? The process of church discipline worked. And this brother came home. And the Spirit wrote to the church and said, 
you all take him back and you hug him and you make him feel like he's part of your own because he is part of your own. It's a wonderful testament to the mercy and the grace and the forgiveness of our God. If you look at your life this evening and you're craving that forgiveness and that grace and that mercy, it's found in Jesus. And if you've never come to Jesus for the first time, you can proclaim him as your king. You can unite with him in baptism and raise to walk a new life like we talked about this morning. Maybe as a Christian, you haven't been living as you should and you need to come back and you need that forgiveness. We want to pray with you and pray for you and help you. If we can help you respond to the gospel in any way tonight, would you come while we stand and while we sing?